Now we are going to visit another part of Africa to learn of a very important set of apparitions there. Sister Reynolda May was born October 21, 1901 and baptized Francisca in Germany. One of eight children, she grew up on a farm, a lively and charming child with a strong devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. Her parish priest greatly encouraged vocations and she joined the missionary Benedictine sisters at Tutsin. She went through a trial of illness, then professed her first vows on February 10, 1925. Six months later, the young woman received the missionary cross and left for South Africa. I hope a book comes out on her someday. Probably all of those young European men and women who left their families to be missionaries deserve to be canonized, since most of them died in spirit for the faith the day they got into the boat. Most would never see their families again, and most would die very young. But Sister Reynolda was hardy. She would have a long life of loving service. For three years, while completing her formation, she first worked as a seamstress until she made her final vows in 1928. She learned the Zulu language with enthusiasm, and in 1936 she was the first sister in the territory to be trained as a midwife. Two years later, in 1938, the Benedictine Mission Hospital opened in Nangoma, and Sister Rinalda was put in charge of the maternity department and the Nangoma Hospital. This would be located close to Nagome, where the Benedictines bought an 800-acre farm in 1944, just a few years later. Typical to their charism, they used cattle and agriculture as an income to support their ministry. On the property, they also erected a small school to give children a basic education. The classroom was used as a chapel where the Catholics came together on Sundays to celebrate Mass or to participate in a service conducted by a catechist. Sister Reynolda was recognized by her peers for being disciplined, wise, calm, serene, friendly, always smiling, and dedicated to teaching. Her students look forward to her conferences, where she often improvised to explain things in the primitive hospital. She took the initiative in problem solving, creative in shaping their style of prayer. She became one of the more renowned among the Catholic missionaries in Zululand because of her zeal for the people, for the poor, and for drawing in converts to the faith. She encouraged many to pray the rosary and to teach others to do the same. The Republic of South Africa is the southernmost country on the continent. In 1647, two employees of the Dutch East India Company were shipwrecked at what became Cape Town, the turning point for ships rounding the corner as they crossed from Europe to Asia or Asia to Europe. The Dutch colonized the area and it's still the first language. South Africa has 11 official languages and it recognizes several more. In 1948, the National Party was elected to power. It strengthened the racial segregation begun under the Dutch and British colonial rule. The nationalist government classified all peoples into three races and developed rights and limitations for each. The white minority, less than 20%, controlled the vastly larger black majority. The legally institutionalized segregation became known as apartheid. Whites enjoyed the highest standard of living in all of Africa, comparable to the first world western nations, and the blacks remained disadvantaged by almost every standard, including income, education, housing, and life expectancy. Under apartheid, the non-white majority were forced to live in separate areas from whites and use separate public facilities. Contact between the two groups were limited. Despite strong and consistent opposition to apartheid within and outside of South Africa, its laws remained in effect for 50 years. Undoubtedly, all of this turmoil and injustice had its impact on Sister Reynalda and the people she served. But Mary's messages had nothing to do with politics. The First Encounter, August 22, 1955, Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Shortly after Holy Communion, Mary stood before me, very close by. Everything was seen in spirit. I was drawn into another atmosphere. Mary showed herself in a wonderful light, more beautiful than the sun. She was robed all in white, 
with a flowing veil from top to toe. Upon her breast rested a very large host, surrounded by a brilliant corona, radiating life. She was a living monstrance. Mary stood upon a globe, hands and feet invisible. I felt like entering a cloud, drawn by Mary, away from the earth. I had my eyes closed, but I saw so much light that for several days I was very much dazzled by the beauty and light that I had seen. I forgot to say, Sister Rinalda had been a religious by now for 30 years. Mary said to her, Call me Tabernacle of the Most High. You too are such a tabernacle. Believe it. I wish to be called upon by this title for the glory of my Son. I wish that more such tabernacles be prepared. I mean human hearts. I wish that the altars be surrounded more frequently by praying people. Don't be afraid. Make it known. To whom, I asked. Don't be afraid. Tell your priest. The second and third encounters happened in October 1955 on two separate occasions. Sister Rinalda had very similar encounters as the first. It happened immediately after Holy Mass. It was the same figure, the same place, the same requests were repeated, but the following was added. Make these words known to everybody. Don't be afraid. You are God's tool. Then Christ came out of this large host and was in union with Sister Rinalda. The fourth encounter, March 15, 1956. After Holy Mass, Mary stood before me, looking very serious. My child, I know about your anxiety. She bent down and drew me to herself. You asked for a sign? Not for myself, I said, but for the others, that they may believe. They do not believe me. I wish that a shrine be erected for me in the place where seven springs come together. There I'll let my graces flow in abundance. Many people shall turn to God. When I asked, where is this place? She made a movement of the hand and pointed majestically upwards in a certain direction. This made me very happy, and I felt a great assurance. Don't be afraid. Make it known. It is my work. I shall see you again. The fifth encounter was June 5, 1956, on the Feast of the Sacred Heart during benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. Sister Ronalda had this other vision. No message was given, but Mary revealed herself in a simple yet profound way by coming out of the monstrance and approaching me, she said, as a living monstrance. The sixth encounter, March 15th, a year later, 1957. I wonder March 15, twice the same day, if there's some significance for Sister Rinalda. I know for me it's the death anniversary of Sister Marianne, one of the holiest Carmelites I ever knew. Mary gave the following message. I come to strengthen you. I make use of your nothingness. Be totally humble. Pausing, she drew me to herself and said, I want to save the world to the host, my fruit. I am completely one with the host, as I was one with Jesus under the cross. Fearful things are in store for you, unless you all convert. We, yes, if the religious do not convert, and if the world does not convert, Mother, just give me a sign. You, be all love and readiness. All people who hear and believe these my words are going to receive a sign from me. Make all these words known. The seventh encounter, May 24, 1957. In a comforting voice, don't lose heart. In December that year, when visiting Nagomi, Sister Rinalda got a strong urge that this was the place Our Lady wanted her shrine erected the place where seven springs met. The eighth encounter, a, some months later, April 17, 1958. Like a command, Mary said, go to your place, hurry up, the hour is advanced. I must keep back the streams of grace with force because you do not make any effort to help me. I am asking for help from you, my chosen ones. What are we supposed to do? Be hosts, prepare hosts for me hosts who put themselves completely at my disposal. Only a flaming sea of hosts can drive back the hate of the godless world and restrain the angry hand of the Father. Don't get tired. I find consolation in revealing myself to you. I shall never abandon you. Where is the place of the springs? On your property, on the mountain. 
With the movement of the hand, Mary indicated a second time the very same direction. Don't be afraid. Make haste to make it known. A picture of Mary, Tabernacle of the Most High, was painted, and it hung in the classroom until 1966, when a small chapel was built and blessed by the Nagome Farm in the area where the Seven Springs were situated. The chapel was opened and consecrated on Pentecost Sunday. Twelve years later, the Ninth Encounter, March 23, 1970. It was the second night after a horrible appearance of the devil. I was woken from my sleep. All around me was light. Mary, Tabernacle of the Most High, stood beside me. She took me into her arms and consoled me. She said, I know about your anxiety. I stand by you. I shall not abandon you. Look to the other side. There stood St. Michael in armor and a lance in his hands. On his right stood a cherubim robed in white, his arms folded. After about two minutes they disappeared, and so did the brilliant light. There was a, this was a great consolation for me. The tenth and final account, encounter, May 2, 1971. Shortly before I left Nagomi, after a visit there, I went again to the chapel with a small group of women. A catechumen said she wants to believe, but complained of a neighbor calling her names and quarreling. I prayed aloud with the women and asked Mary to help this woman and to convert this troublemaker. Suddenly I noticed that the picture was very much alive. She stepped forward and her face was immensely beautiful. In my excitement, I shouted out, look at Mary. I am convinced that the women also there saw Mary. I personally was so moved that I walked away silently. The same troublesome man asked the priest for pardon, and since then there is peace. At age 74 in 1975, Sister Rinalda celebrated her 50th anniversary as a Benedictine nun and retired from her position as head of the maternity department. She devoted the last eight years of her life to visiting the sick, comforting the dying, and reconciling them with the church. She died April 1, 1981, at the missionary station near the Inkama Abbey. Her funeral attracted an unusually large number of mourners. Ecclesiastical approval was surely hampered by the political turmoil in the country, but Nagome was not forgotten, far from it. It attracted more and more pilgrims. There were healings and testimonies on spiritual rejuvenation at the springs. On Saturday, October 3, 1992, Bishop Monsue Biasse blessed the open-air altar. The bishop celebrated Holy Mass with several hundred pilgrims who had come from the Diocese of Eshoe and from farther away. He used this opportunity to declare the Marian Shrine at Nagome a place of prayer. Nagome had thus become, to all intents and purposes, a sanctuary of Our Lady, which has the approval of the Church. It meant that pilgrimages to Nagome were not merely allowed, but could be actively promoted. Two years later, in 1994, another bishop, Bishop Rowland, blessed a statue of Our Lady, Tabernacle of the Most High, then a new crucifix, and a new painting of Our Lady to display it in the small shrine. In 1996, the bishop also blessed a new grotto and statue of Our Lady. In 1997, Benedictine nuns from Twasana moved into a new convent that had been built alongside the Nagome Shrine as a community of adoration. Their main apostolate was to become prayer, with a special focus on adoration of the Blessed Sacrament and care of the pilgrims. Would you have seen a picture of her as tabernacle? On the internet. What does she look like? She's just, like Mary said, she's all in white, and then, but the, right in front of her is this enormous host, and her, her hands and feet aren't visible, so she kind of looks like she's a monstrance. She's just holding the host to be adored.